every Lent, Holy Mother Church begins the Lenten journey, the Lenten season, with a teaching from our Lord Jesus Christ from his Sermon on the Mount. And right at the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives what we call the Big Three for Lent. He gives a teaching about almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. And these are the big three that the church gives to us as and holds up Jesus' teaching about prayer, almsgiving, and fasting for our Lenten journey. But oftentimes we think of almsgiving, prayer, and fasting as penitential, as some kind of punishment we have to do for sin. And yet the church in her wisdom and her tradition talks about these three things in light of healing. And I love the old Irish penitentials, which sound pretty austere and, and bad, but if you go back to those old Irish penitentials from the 5th and 6th and 7th century, all those penitentials are about healing for the sinner. How by doing these practices, we can be healed. Well, do you feel like you need healing in your life? Is this journey of Lent this season an opportunity for you to find deeper healing in God's love? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Well, I'm so excited to have a special guest tonight, Sister Miriam James Heidlin, and uh, she's an alumni of the Augustine Institute, just got our 2022 Alumni of the Year Award. She has a wonderful podcast called Abiding Together, and she has a recent book called Restore, which is a Lenten journey of reflections for this Lenten season. And Sister Miriam, it's just a delight to have you back on the show. Oh, thank you, Dr. Gray. It's a delight to be back with you, especially as we begin the season of Lent. You know, we talk about this idea uh, during the Lent every year about almsgiving, fasting, prayer. And I think a lot of people think about this as a penitential season, right? That uh, I've got to feel guilty, you know, uh, I've got to feel bad about myself. And we think about this as kind of uh, a bit of a, you know, drudgery of fasting and giving things up and making sacrifices. And yet you, you, you try to approach this with this idea of healing. What inspired you to, to focus your reflections called Restore, which I love that name, and that kind of evokes this idea of healing. What, what inspired you to focus on healing with these things? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think many years, obviously, I grew up Catholic, and I, I, you know, we did the Lenten thing, of course, every year we all do, and I, it just was kind of a, a, a mortification that you did, or just, you know, you kind of gave up all these things, and then a week later, you want them all back, and, and it's, <laughs> on Easter Sunday, you're kind of like, well, did it really even make a difference, and then I got to be an adult, and I got to be in religious life, and I could just see there was like just kind of a block somewhere, and every, I think all of us have different uh, reactions to Lent. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Some people it's kind of a necessary evil. Some people try to just, you know, get through it or get over it. But I really, you know, over the years of journeying in my own life and just also studying the church teachings and kind of understanding what the Lord is teaching us there, that actually the, the disciplines of prayer, fasting and almsgiving are given to us as a gift mm. to bring us into wholeness and communion. And every single one of us suffers from the rupture of original sin. We suffer from ruptures of love in our life. And so the direct disciplines, you know, the DISC, which you know very well means student. It's like this, this being a student of love. And so what the Lord is doing is he's leading us into the desert. He's going to invite us into the desert with him. And he's going to invite us to certain practices so he can bring us into wholeness and healing and in those three different areas, because each of the different areas has a profound healing effect upon part of our life. Mm, I love that. And before we dive any further, I want to invite people to have, if they have questions in our audience, to text us on the text line, 720-650-0100. You can text your questions, and sometimes we get to them on this show, sometimes in another show. And so we always like and to invite everyone's questions and feedback, and so please join the conversation. Well, Sister Miriam, when, when we think about almsgiving, let's just start off with the first one, because I'll we'll walk through all three of these. But when we talk about almsgiving and generosity to the poor and to others, how can that be healing, right? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah how, how can people think about that in terms of their own healing? Sure. Well, we usually just consider almsgiving as a gift of money, kind of like you know, writing a check or, okay, yes, I donated to that charity. And, and yes, there is, uh, of course, a donation of, of what we have and monetarily to the Lord. But really, almsgiving is a call to give the gift of ourselves. Mm. It's to make a gift of ourselves. And so we give alms monetarily, but we give alms through our presence. 
Amen. We give alms through the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. We give alms through forgiveness and true alms giving. Like when Jesus is watching people put their treasure, you know, their, their temple tax into the treasury and he sees the widow, she gives, she gave out of her, like out of her need, out of her poverty. And she's really giving the gift of herself. She's not just giving something of excess. And so true alms giving really is truly the gift of ourselves, which is why it's, it's still really challenging at times yeah. because it calls us to, to allow the Lord to purify the places where we are, you know, self-centered, the places where we're selfish, the places where our hearts are, are turned away. And he's calling us into communion with each other, call us in mm. communion with each other. So true almost giving us a profound effect of healing upon ourselves and everybody around us. I love that. You know, I, especially when you talk about that, oh, the, the poor old widow in the temple and in, in the Greek, it's pretty dramatic, actually. It's her whole mm. bios, her whole life. We oh. can translate it livelihood, but literally, Jesus is saying she gave her whole life in contrast to those who gave out of their abundance, right? They gave, yeah. they had extra. So they gave out of their extra. She gave out of her necessity. And so what you're saying is that we should think about alms, not just in terms of our financial resources, but of our time, our very selves. Is that, mm. so we should think about yeah. donating time to, particular people that maybe we don't want to give time to that we're too busy. Is that, is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And that's certainly part of it. And I think just even being present to people is a way of giving alms. I mean, sometimes be like, what do I do for Lent? I, you can mention just putting your phone away and just be present to people and just listen. Mm. And even that we kind of, we say, oh, I listen well, but just the fact of listening, of receiving somebody else, not already preparing your own argument or how they're wrong, but just to listen and just to receive somebody, uh, you know, shockingly enough, most people do not want our unsolicited advice. Like they, <laughs> they just want to be listened to. And that, you know, that's a huge, a huge discipline of because mm. Christ is always present to us he is mm. always completely and totally and fully present to us and so that is certainly one way I, I talk about in the book of um you know admonishing the sinner of bearing wrongs with patience I have a whole week on forgiveness of what true mm. forgiveness really is and the profound healing effect of of forgiveness in our life of what Christ is calling us to and so these are real these are real realities that the God is inviting us into. So that on Easter Sunday, we're, we're not the same as we were on Ash Wednesday. Mm, yeah, and that's, that. that's important because that's the whole point. It's a transformation into the heart of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, people talk about St. John Paul II when they encountered him, they always felt like he was so present to them. Yes. Right? He was really looking at them and listening to them and he was intent. And it's so easy for all of us to get so busy. Uh, there's so many things for us to do and get done. And, you know, modern technology, keeps us really busy. And so being present to others, it's so hard now because we all want to, you know, look at our screens, right? We, we always have our smartphones and our screens. And so what you're saying is that we need to think about generosity of our presence, mm -hmm. being attentive and having our attention on others during this Lent. Is that, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yes, and that's something that we, something that we can all do, and it's a gift that the Lord is calling us to give. It's a gift of, mm. of you know, where are the places that we hold resentments and grudges toward people, and places where our hearts are closed, where you know you can go to Sunday Mass and you can pray your daily rosary and things like that. But all of us have places where our hearts, it doesn't feel safe enough to love. It doesn't feel safe mm. to let somebody in. It doesn't feel safe to let Jesus close to parts of our hearts, and and these are the real things that the Lord is is inviting us into, not just practices on the surface but these are things that we allow ourselves to be transformed by so that Christ can come and, and remake our hearts. To restore means to bring back. He's bringing back the truth of who we are, not just in the garden of Adam and Eve, but in the eternal garden with Christ himself. He's, he's bringing us back to the truth of who he knows us to be. And so the journey of Lent is dangerous because it's dangerous to our idols. It's dangerous to our self-defense mechanisms, our facades that we all have. Um, but it is, allows for the freedom of the truth of who we are, you know, the mm. glorious freedom of the children of God so that we can live in the truth of who we are. Mm. Sister Miriam, you mentioned this idea of being generous with our presence, and you talked about forgiveness in light of that. It strikes me that it's not easy to be present or attentive to people that we feel have hurt us or that we're mm. angry with or that we haven't forgiven. Is that, is that really mm. one of the things you're challenging, is this idea of being present to people that we need to forgive? That that is certainly one way to it, and I th I think that it's an invitation to 
it's an invitation to deeper freedom of heart. And I know for myself, it just, I'm a recovering addict and I just had a lot of trauma in my life and journeying with so many people over the years. I'm just from different walks of life and, and hearing people's stories. And, you know, I, for one of the things that kept me sick and just kind of self, you know, in self-defense mechanisms and just the areas of my heart where I was just judgmental or self-righteous was I had a deep misunderstanding of what forgiveness was. And I thought to forgive means just to forgive and forget, just get over it. It's not a big deal. And just to kind of pretend true, why forgiveness is actually heroic is because to truly forgive. And I talk about this in step-by-step step in the book is it really actually requires us to take a full account of what happened. It requires us to be honest. It's a journey. It's not an event. It's a journey of of deeper truth of, of what was taken from us. How was, you know, Aquinas talks about forgiveness, you know, being an injustice, you know, or justice about, it's about justice. It's about what was taken and what is the Lord inviting us to, to offer somebody a gift, but it's through the whole restoration of, of, of our hearts. And so that's why it's such a, profound topic why he speaks about it in the heart of the our father he could talk about anything but he talks mm. about forgiveness and it's not just lip service it's it's a profound transformation of the heart and as we practice it it transforms us in in deep and beautiful ways in ways that we never we never thought possible and so there like i said there's a whole week spent on that to help mm. us understand to allow the holy spirit to reveal to us where are the places where i'm withholding and what is my understanding of my per, myself and the other person like what's going on there because there's a whole reason why we do that and the lord would love to talk about those deep places with us. Well, I love that you talk about forgiveness in the heart of the Our Father. And of course, you can find this in the middle of Matthew chapter 6 in the Gospel of Matthew. And that leads us to that second thing that of the big three that the church calls us to, and that is prayer. And you talk about forgiveness being in the heart of that. I think one of the disciplines that people try to think about during Lent is, I should pray more. Mm -hmm. And they might add different prayers and they different prayer practices, but talk about the kind of prayer that makes us do that kind of work of getting yeah. closer to God and working through things like forgiveness and uh, mm -hmm. forgiving ourselves and forgiving others mm -hmm. and drawing mm -hmm. closer to God. That's a different kind of prayer than just, and I, and I love the rosary, so I'm not pitting this yeah. against the rosary because I think there's graces yeah. that come from the rosary, but this is, I think you're talking about some kind of mental meditation, mental prayer, where we have to reflect more deeply and quietly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Gray. I mean, th these are the deep places of our heart. This is, this is, you know, prayer is an encounter of the heart. It's when heart speaks to heart. It's the Lord, you know, he's waiting for us. He's present. He's inviting us into his presence. And, and as we go into his presence and as, you know, St. Paul says to pray without ceasing. And so as we spend our day with the Lord, when we love somebody, we hear their heart and they hear ours and they reveal our hearts to us. Like, you know, John Paul II, love to quote God, he best that it's God who, you know, Jesus makes us, he reveals man to himself. And so in prayer, God reveals me to myself. He tells me the truth about myself. He tells me about my belovedness. He tells me about my foundation in him. He tells me about the places where I'm missing the mark, places where my heart is turned away. And it's it's this kind of heart speaks to heart that the Lord is very interested in. And this is what heals this kind of prayer. And even if it is the rosary, the mass, I mean, all the, everything should be taken into the deep places of the heart to where our hearts are encountering of him. And that's what heals our relationship of, of who we think God is, because all of us have, you know, all of, and we can have an advanced degree in theology and still in our heart have places where we believe a different theology in our heart, which is why many times when there's a dissonance between the two, the heart will went out and will say, why am I acting like this? Mm -hmm. Like what's, I, I know the truth, like what's happening and what's happening in these little places of our heart that have yet to really encounter the father's love. Well, that, I love that idea of encountering God in that prayer that you talk about. But someone might say, well, that works for you, sister. You're a religious sister, and you're dedicated to this, and you've got a theology degree from the Augustus Institute. But when I pray, I just hear silence. How do I hear God speak in my heart? How do you answer that question mm -hmm. for people? Well, there's many ways that the church gives us to pray uh, through guided meditation, through Lexio Divina, through the rosary, through, um, but understanding of when we come before the Lord and I, I'll lead, I lead you through in the book, I lead you through like some prompts of like, what is Jesus saying? Like what's on your heart right now? And to kind of help us understand how to listen to the voice of God. I know Father Timothy Gallagher has a wonderful series on Ignatian discernment, but it's like, how do you listen to the voice of God? What is the voice of God? That God is consistent. God is simple. God doesn't contradict himself. He leads us into truth. And so when we start to experience those movements of our, our spirit with the Lord, we can begin to understand 
what, what God is saying to us, but God is always speaking. He, he's so beautiful. Like God is so wonderful. And he's always speaking to us in a, a, a form, whether it is through silence or it is through music or it's through art or it's through beauty, it's through peace. It's through what we experience, you know, even in our bodies as we sit with the Lord, because we're incarnational. And so the Lord is always speaking to us. It's just a matter of us tuning our hearts to him to hear what he's saying. And he's always leading mm. and guiding us. I love that idea of tuning our hearts to hear what he's saying. And I, mm -hmm. I think if, if one of the questions people oftentimes have, Sister Miriam, is, well, when I sit in that solitude of prayer and I'm sitting and I'm trying to hear the Lord, all I hear is myself. I hear my cries, my pain, my anxieties. What do you tell people who, as they're wrestling to hear God's voice and what comes out first and foremost is their own thoughts and pains and desires? What do they do with that? Mm -hmm. I think, we, well, what we do is we give them to the Lord. <laughs> and the Lord loves to hear those places of our hearts. And as we pour out our heart before him, like Hannah does in front of Eli, like Hannah pours her heart out before him. And I just, I love that whole story of Hannah, which is so beautiful. And as, as she pours her heart out to him, then she can receive the Lord. Mm. And so there is a time where we pour our heart out and then we offer our hearts to the Lord and we say, okay, Lord, I please, I need to hear mm. your heart here. And we're just going to listen and we're not going to give him a time limit and we're not going to limit God on how he can speak. Mm. But he's very interested. God is very interested in what we're interested in. But if it matters to you, it matters to the Lord. He would love mm. to speak about that. It's not trifling to him. And so when we can speak our hearts to them and then also give him space to speak to us, we begin the, the reciprocity of the, of the relationship of the Lord mm. and our hearts become deeper tuned to his voice. I love that, that Hannah doesn't hide her heartache from the Lord. She doesn't. And she doesn't let it become something that hinders her dialogue no. with God, it actually becomes her dialogue mm -hmm. with God. So what you're saying mm -hmm. is that you take where you're at in your pain and you begin to share it with the Lord and all of a sudden you are in dialogue. You are yeah. in deeper prayer by doing mm -hmm. that. And so sometimes mm -hmm. what people think is an obstacle to prayer is actually the doorway into God's heart, isn't it? Oh yes, and Dr. Gray, many times it's the very things that we don't want to talk about. <laughs> That's mm. the what the Lord's like. Can we talk about that? Because I love you, <laughs> and the Lord's not a He's not afraid of that. He's not He's not ashamed. He's not embarrassed. He doesn't. Mm. He's so gracious and so good, and He's willing to receive every single part of our heart and to and to to tell us the truth about our hearts. There, He He loves to do that. Yeah. When it comes to silence and trying to hear God, and all you hear is silence. Was there a time, how, how do you deal with silence? And, and was there a time that you were, that intimidated you in your own growing prayer life that you were afraid of silence? Oh, yes. I was afraid of silence in general, and then especially silence from the Lord. Whenever I remember many years ago when I first started in religious life, like just the silence, I mean, that was before cell phones even. It's like the silence when I didn't have something on, because then all these things that I didn't want to think about would come to the surface. So I would use the silence. And I think we do that a lot of times. We we feel uncomfortable, so we grab our phone. We feel uncomfortable, so we try to affirm ourselves or we try to eat something. I mean, it's, it's, this, it's the perpetual problem of the human heart where our hearts are restless. And we don't know what to do. And so the Lord is inviting us to, to turn to him. And so learning now when I'm finding myself uncomfortable, even to this day, there, there are times in my life where I'm uncomfortable. Like, Lord, I don't like this feeling or I don't like this thought or I don't know what to do. But the, the, what, what I'm learning more and more is just, a, you know, as a religious sister, but as just a lover of Jesus, like as a disciple, I, Jesus, I love you. I don't know what to do with this right now. And I need you to come speak to me here. I need you to be with me here. And just his presence of he doesn't just say anything. Mm. It just the leading of his heart for me there is so transformative. Yeah, uh, it's so transformative. It's such a beautiful invitation for that transformative mm -hmm. experience in the heart. Now, one of the th other the, we've talked about two out of the three. We've talked about prayer, and then there's fasting. And I think people can see how prayer can be really spiritual. Fasting is something that goes on in the secular world. Everyone's doing intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. So what's particularly mm -hmm. spiritual or healing mm -hmm. about fasting? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have a quote in the section on fasting from John Paul II that he talks about, you know, it's different than a therapeutic diet, but when fasting, when it's practiced properly, actually has a healing effect on the soul. Mm -hmm. Because what fasting does is actually orders our loves. And you can fast from a lot of different things. You can fast from food. You can fast from the snarky comment that you want to make. You can mm -hmm. fast from, you know, your own opinion offering. I mean, it's amazing the things we can fast from. And so when we are invited by the Lord to take on an area of fasting in our life, what it does is it not only streamlines our, our hearts there, but it also reveals our deeper desires because everything that why we're aching for something, why we're hungering for something, it's revealing something else 
So when we find the, and if we find the ache after we fasted, that's wonderful because that's what's supposed to be happening. And so we find ourselves really wanting to have whatever we, you know, felt the Lord inviting us to give to him for Lent. Okay, Lord, what am I really hungering for? What am I, am I using that as an idol? Has it become a place of false comfort for me? Jesus, come, I want to feast on your scripture. I want to feast on your presence. I want to feast on being present with people instead of whatever that is. So it actually orders our loves. And when our loves are ordered, the more our loves are ordered, the more we love like Jesus. And all of us want to love like Jesus. Um, we, most of us have no idea how to do that. And so one of the things that happens is fasting helps us reveal our hearts and it helps us order our love. So we can, our yes means yes. And our no means no. And it's, it's difficult, but it's it's so incredibly worth it. So what I hear you saying is that really what we in our deepest heart hunger for is God's love. And sometimes yes. by eating and drinking, we're trying to distract ourselves with these little consolations that hide our deeper desire and need for the mm -hmm. consolation that comes from being loved by God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many, you know, many times that does happen. And, and even in things that aren't excess like it's it is good for us to feel our true aches like it is good for us to feel those areas of our life where we're like lord i'm i'm hungry and instead of going even to something that's good i mean just spend that time with lord say lord speak to me about my aches speak to me about my desire come lord order my loves you know what am i really hungering for what am i what are you asking of me and and jesus says there are certain things in our life that are only cast out through prayer and fasting and so many times, you know, we have addictions or things like that. And when we're undertaking that with a deep spirit of prayer and fasting, that can help aid the spiritual component to ushering things out that are destroying our lives, that are Im impeding us from loving like Christ. And so the, it's a powerful, powerful discipline that the Lord gives us to bring us into wholeness with him. You know, I, I love how you talk about Jesus talking about the power of prayer and fasting together as mm -hmm. a, a dynamic com combination. And someone asks, do you have to do all three of these, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, or can you just choose one of those during Lent? What, what, do, you, what do you recommend? Well, the church invites us to all because prayer heals our relationship with God. Fasting mm. heals our relationship with ourselves and almsgiving heals our relationship with others. Mm. So the church invites us to, to all three in some form. And I would just really... Uh, invite our viewers and our listeners to really ask the Lord instead of us like, I'm going to do this. Let's just sit with the Lord and say, Lord, what are you inviting me to? Mm -hmm. And let's just see what he, what he stirs. It's one, the one thing is better. One thing done well is better than 10 things not done at all. So even if it's one thing, I'm always about the one thing, but let's sit with the Lord and just ask him, Lord, how do you want to make my heart more like yours this Lent? And, and just see what he says. I think we'd be surprised at his graciousness and goodness there. Mm. I love that. And, it all strikes me as very relational. So you're talking about as, as I'm reflecting mm -hmm. on this, and rather than, rather than just starting with prayer, almsgiving, and fasting, I think about my relationship with God, my relationship mm -hmm. with others, and my relationship with myself and interiorly. Mm -hmm. And where do I feel the greatest disconnect and mm -hmm. trouble and restlessness? And that's maybe an area that I have, I've got to put as a priority and think, okay, if it's with mm -hmm. God, then I really need to focus on a, on a, on a different or deeper way or a consistent way to pray if it's with others mm -hmm. and you think about being attentive to and generous to others and focused on others you know maybe i'm naturally an introvert and it's easy for me to pray with god and be ordered yeah. myself but working with others is messy and maybe that's where I'm, i've got wounds <laughs> or fears right so it's yeah. it's really a call to reflect on these three different sets of relationships but it's mm -hmm. very relational your your approach sister miriam yeah. Well, God is relational and, mm -hmm. and that's what the Lord, you know, Jesus, Jesus doesn't come to fix us. He does not come to fix us. He comes to bring us into wholeness and communion. And I think sometimes we'd rather have him fix us so that we can kind of be on our way and do our own thing. But it's like, oh, he, he, mm -hmm. he comes to love me here. Like he's mm -hmm. coming to bring me into wholeness and communion here. He's coming to have a relationship with me. He cares about me. He's not going anywhere. He's made a covenant with me. I mean, the covenant of baptism that I'm yours and you are mine forever that gives the safety for everything in our hearts and lives to come out because Christ will never leave us like that. Just, I sometimes weep over just talking about like, that's, mm. that is stunning. That changes everything. And when we know who we are in Christ, th that changes how we, how we relate to him, how we see ourselves, how we see others. Like there's nothing that will ever substitute for the encounter with Jesus Christ, nothing. And, and that's what the world is thirsting for. They're looking at us saying, do you not, do you know about him, but do you know him? Oh, like, do you know that. what he sounds like? Do you, do you know what his mm. mannerisms are? Like, do you know him? Because I mm. want to know him too. And you can't fake that. 
And I th I th that's such a beautiful message, Sister Miriam. And I think so many people think that Lent is a time to do a bunch of things for God, uh, to you know, make our balance sheet a little bit better with adding some credits to all the debits we've been doing all year round. But you're saying that what Jesus really wants is not us to do a bunch of things, but to be. It sounds like yeah. this is more about being than it is doing. Now, the doing relates to the being. Why don't you speak to that mm -hmm. a little bit in terms of mm -hmm. these three things? Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. All of our doing comes from our being, and he's inviting us into a deeper relationship with him this line. And and yes, are the things that we practice, are the, the disciplines that we do, yes. But the Lord is not so much interested in that as he's interested in our heart. As we know, replete throughout scriptures, the Lord is interested in our heart. And you know, as the catechism says, it's it's the heart that's the place of in covenant. It's mm -hmm. a place of encounter. It's the Lord's very interested in what's coming out of the fullness of our heart. And so that's where he's inviting us to this Lent. And it's it's a struggle at times and it's crucifying at times and amen to it. Because mm -hmm. in those places of wrestle, in those places of crucifixion, that's where the new life comes. But if, if we never say yes to the invitation with Christ, we'll, we'll never be able to know the depth of his love. And he, all he's doing is he's just inviting, like he is just inviting us. And would we say yes? Like, would we say yes? That invitation to really reflect on our identity in Christ is what you're, one of the things mm -hmm. I, I'm hearing you say. And I think Jesus is testing at the beginning of, of Lent. We, we see him tested by the devil and the devil says, if you are the son of God. And I think, mm -hmm. th does the devil test us by this question of identity and being, you know, that. Oh, yeah. Mm, Go ahead. Oh, yes. That's his fundamental. That is his fundamental test is he's always he's looking for points of access. And in the book, I talk about an exorcist friend of mine who said, you know, what he realizes after working with his seminarians and hearing confessions and doing deliverance ministry, not exorcisms, that he realizes Satan is like a sniper. He said, Satan with his angelic intellect can intuit your destiny and he will shoot his poisonous arrows in the deepest places. Your wounds are not arbitrary. Your wounds are not random. An enemy has done this, but it's in these places, what in the God sovereignty of God that he's allowed, that the Lord wants to bring us into wholeness and truth. And so the enemy truly prowls like around, like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, which is why we have to know who God is. We have to know who we are because that's our rooting and grounding, not anything we will achieve, not what other people think about us, but it's Christ's yeah. love for us. So that's the deep that, oh, he is relentless. He's mm -hmm. relentless in these places. And so that's why inviting us into these tender places of our heart where most of us spend, you know, most of our life avoiding, these are the places Jesus wants to transform and heal because these are the places where we bring the most life out of that sorrow comes the most beautiful. Beauty. Mm. I love that. You know, um, someone asks, Patty asks, that she has many Protestant friends who like to participate in Lent. Is your book a good place for even Protestants mm. to, to journey during Lent? Oh, yes. You're, you know what? I wrote every meditation with every person in mind. So mm. they're very brief and they're very simple and they're very also inviting to deeper places. So I try to write everyone that no matter where you're coming from, whether that you're just beginning, maybe you're not even a believer or, or maybe you're well into your spiritual life, that God would invite you to something every day. So that's my heart. I try to do that as, as, as well as I possibly could, just inviting people to deeper. It's just deeper encounter with Christ. It's just, here's a book that might help you encounter Jesus. That's all I want to do. So uh, that's really all it is. Yeah. Well, I think it, it's clear to everyone here that you have a heart for bringing people into that encounter, that deep mm -hmm. personal love of Jesus Christ, which is so precious. And uh, I want you to just share how people can encounter this, where they can find this book. And I, I'm hoping we can put this on our Catholic.market store that a lot of our viewers know where that is and they can find that. So hopefully we'll get that on that resource. But And, and we'll, we'll definitely get it on Catholic.market. But where, where else... Um, can people find this information? Did you mention your podcast? Is that going to be a supplement to this? Sure. Yeah. So you can find the book Restore, which is a guided light meditation. Um, it's used for a personal study. You can join a group. You can do it as a parish. It's very simple. Um, if you want to come along with us for our Abiding Together, our Abiding Together podcast, we're going to walk through the book for six weeks. So we're just going to take it section by section. You can come along with us if you want. Uh, and there's a weekly video that will be released every week that will give you kind of an mm -hmm. overview of it. Also, I'll kind of lead you through the week and help your heart prepare. And then we'll just we'll just journey together day by day. So it's a very simple invitation, but one that I that I I really hope, like you're saying, Doctor, I really hope that people find the heart of Christ in it because that's that's really my heart for the book. Like you hear my heart and that's my heart. Mm, I love it. And I think you've given everybody and all of us a, a great challenge to think about fasting, prayer, and almsgiving uh, in light of relationships, our relationship with God, our relationship with others, and the healing that God wants to bring within our own selves and a reordering of our loves. 
uh, yeah. to give us that peace because that's really the fruit of these practices is it leads us to an account with God's love and, and the peace that only comes from knowing Jesus Christ. And uh, I think mm -hmm. that's so important. And I always think that, you know, the fact that almsgiving and fasting flank and bracket prayer, that we're called to that intimacy with our love with our Father in heaven. And if we become generous with others, which is what almsgiving names, as you said, and if we become sacrificial with self, that's the conditions for deep intimacy with God and prayer life. So. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing us. Thank you for this wonderful work you've done with Restore, this beautiful book for Lenten uh, uh, prayer. And uh, we're grateful to have you on the show. Thank you again, Sister Miriam. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Gray. And I, I wish you a very blessed Lent. Uh, thank you. And I want to thank everybody on our audience who supports us through the Mission Circle. Your support allows us to have this ministry. So we're grateful for your support and almsgiving. And uh, next week, we're going to have Father Don Calloway. He's going to talk about Consecration of St. Joseph, and uh, Dr. Ben Akers will be interviewing him, so I hope you can join us for that show, and may the Lord bless and keep you all. Have a holy Lent.